I made plans to preach this sermon quite a while ago, so this isn't a loaded question based on the news. It just happens to sound like it. Do you remember the first time you watched the news and something really messed with your head? Something really shocked you, got your attention? Something that really made you rethink what you believe? Right? A friend of mine, he watched um, the tsunami in 2004, the Indian Ocean, that, that horrible event, and it really changed him and, and, and challenged what he thought about what is good, the world, the nature of God. And, uh, and maybe it wasn't the news, maybe, uh, do you, have you ever been asked a, a question from a child, an innocent question that was a little bit more complicated and deep than they could ever imagined? Why did people treat that person differently, Mom? Right? We get these questions and they are, they are challenging. Um, we grow up, right? if you can put that first picture up, uh, we grow up and we, we teach children to have a, a, a simple faith, right? Because you can only understand so much. Right? The Bible says it, I believe it. Right? Follow Jesus, go to heaven. People who follow Jesus will be nice to me. Do good things, good things will happen. Right? We have this kind of simple faith, this wide open, simple, straight line, and we're going to get from here to there. Not all that challenging, just straightforward understanding of how God works, how the world works. And we want to hold on to this as long as we can, because it's comfortable and easy. And then, well, life starts happening. Right? We have to start questioning. We have to start questioning some of our assumptions and uh, we want to ignore them at times, we must admit, but um, life happens, right? Thinking of why this nice, wide, open, easy, simple faith, this is what I think what Jesus begins to talk about when he, he says these words. He says, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and broad that leads to destruction. There are many who enter through it. The gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. What is the wide and the narrow that Jesus is laying out here? Right? What, what does it mean to be narrow? I, I don't think that this is uh, condoning being narrow-minded. Right? That's one way we think of narrow. I don't think that this is saying you should be narrow-minded for Jesus, jerks for Jesus, yippee. I mean, I don't think that's quite what we're getting at here. Uh, I think that uh, if we're going to understand what he means by wide and narrow, we need to understand what Jesus says in light of the way that Jesus lives. That, that makes sense, right? That, that what Jesus says and what Je how Jesus lives should line up. And so I think what we need to look at is how is Jesus narrow? Right? How is Jesus narrow? What, what, was Jesus, what does that look like? Right? If we look at the way that Jesus responded to people, to start trying to think this through, when Jesus looked at certain people, he said, follow me, be my disciple. To other folks, he said, listen to the sermon. doesn't invite them to be his disciple. To the folks who put him on trial, he has nothing to say. Right? He just... He just clams up, and that's that. To one person who he heals, the, the garrison demoniac, we call him, the guy who is healed of legion, who then all that legion goes into the pigs and they run off the cliffs, right? To, to him, Jesus heals and says, now go back to your people and tell the good news of Jesus. He sends him out as the first missionary. To others who Jesus heals, he says, oh, well, good job, carry on. And off they go, right? To um, the Pharisee who comes to Jesus and asks a good question, he gives the entire night, John 3, Nicodemus, that entire require, records this entire long discussion Jesus has with the Pharisee. To the Pharisees that show up and try to trick Jesus with a question, he responds with his own question. By whose authority did John the, baptize, ba John the Baptist baptize? Right? He's not going to play with them. Right? Jesus responds to different people in different ways. Right? That, that's, what, that's what we see here. It's even possible that Jesus is learning as he goes. When, when there's a, a foreigner, an immigrant lady, who shows up and, and asks for help for her daughter to be healed, Jesus says, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Right? And the woman says, yes, Lord, but, not even the, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from the master's table. And Jesus says, oh, your faith is great. Go forth, your daughter is healed. Right? This is in Matthew 15. And so maybe Jesus learns as he goes along the way, part of being fully human. Right? 
I believe that this, this attention to the individual in front of him and responding to different people in different ways, I think that's what we're looking at here. The way to salvation is not a wide open path of believing a few simple things and ignoring what's in front of us. Right? Just a simple faith, and, you know, just oh, let me hold on to these three or four things and I'm just going to ignore the rest of anything that challenges what I believed earlier in my life. Right? If I hear no evil, see no evil, don't have to deal with it, just going to be... Right? I think what we see with Jesus is how Jesus is narrowly focused on the person in front of him, determining what is the right path in that moment with that person at that time. To put it much more catchily, what would Jesus do? Right? What would Jesus do? That, that's the question. And, and what would Jesus do in each particular situation is what he would do right then and there. And so I don't think the, 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 wide, the wide and narrow here, the wide open path of, of just making your assumptions and never questioning, I think what we're looking at instead is narrow. And how narrow? I think it's as narrow as one set of footsteps. Right? The narrow path is exactly two foot wide. Jesus is left foot and Jesus is right foot. Right? That's whose footsteps we seek to be in, right? Jesus' footsteps. And so the question is, what would Jesus do right here? That's what it means to be narrow. To be narrowly focused on what is Jesus' response to, to this situation, to this, this challenge, this question that, that comes up. I think this is what Paul is getting at in his advice to the church at Philippi about having the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, who paid attention to who was in front of him, the situation that challenged him. Being humble, right? Working out your salvation with reverence. That, that's the turn of phrase that Paul uses. Pay, working out your salvation, working out the path that you're going to follow, working out what you're going to do by by paying attention to who is front of, in front of you and allowing these new questions and situations to impact those simple, wide, easy assumptions and, and the way it gets a lot narrower. Then we go from this to go to the next picture. I, I love this picture because I think that is far more of what the life of faith looks like, isn't it? Right? There's this, I don't know if you can see it, there's this narrow path and it's kind of winding all over the place. It's always heading towards Jesus. It's always heading towards the cross. But you're always kind of winding and you're responding to what's in front of you. Right? And I have to say that is my own experience with following Jesus. I had my assumptions. Right? You follow Jesus, you go to heaven. Then I started learning about Martin Luther King Jr., one of the great heroes of the faith of the 20th century. And you know who taught him about nonviolence? Gandhi. Right? And you know what Gandhi isn't? Not a Christian. He's a Hindu, right? So, is Gandhi burning in hell? Right? Another question for you. You're sort of raised with a certain set of assumptions and you meet people. Like my, one of the assumptions I was raised, if, if, if you just work hard, you'll be able to do fine. And you just have to work hard. And people who aren't doing fine just aren't working hard enough. And then I meet people. I'm down at the food pantry multiple times a month for people to get phone calls. And if you don't have food in this town, if you're out of food, I'm one people that gets called. So I'm down there on a regular basis and I was talking to a mother of three and struggling with getting food stamps to work. And this mother is working, has a job. And she was just telling me about this. She was so sorry that I had to come down and help her when she had no food for her kids. And we were talking about this and said, you know, do you, it's hard to deal with food stamps, right? And she was telling me how hard it is to deal with that. And I asked, which, which one gets you off your off your duff and off and going to work, go find work and bettering yourself. Is it how the hard the government's for pushing you or is it your kids? Right? And it's your kids. Right? I was going to church this morning. I stopped to fill up my coffee cup and I stopped to fill it up at one of the gas stations here in town. And I asked the lady how she was doing. This was not planned at all. I asked the lady how she was doing and she started talking to me. She doesn't have a day off till next Saturday. And, uh, and she has to go deal with food stamp paperwork. And she has four kids. Raising those four kids doesn't have a day off till Saturday and is, is struggling with that. Right? My whole understanding of poverty as you know, you're just in poverty because you don't work hard enough. Yeah, I, yeah, well, life changes, right? You have to look at the situation in front of you and, and respond. I, I remember the moment then I, I opened an email, and uh, it was an email from another Methodist pastor who, proceed, who gave me a, a, a butt chew and, and carbon copied the DS, uh, like I, I have never, rarely ever received, uh, questioning my integrity and, and everything I was doing. And uh, it, it made me question, right? Is everyone who's called pastor worthy of that title? You assume, I would always assume so. 
Right? You start paying attention. We have these broad assumptions about life. And then you get someone right in front of you, you hear a life story about Martin Luther King, or the lady who you're helping get food, or that beloved child of God who chewed my butt via email. And, and, and those assumptions shift, right? Things get a little bit narrower because you've got to respond to the situation in front of you. What does it mean to, what, what do I believe about people of other faith, of other Christians, about poverty, about pastors? How, what do I believe about these things? I think we are called not to a wide path of easy, trite answers. Instead, we are called to a narrow path of paying attention to the person in front of us which is what Jesus did. And then responding in what makes sense in that moment at that time, following in the narrow footsteps of Jesus. A path that, that goes in different ways at different moments. Right? I, I think this, this wisdom is captured, it's, it's in the Old Testament, uh, in Ecclesiastes, you've heard this passage many times before. There's an appointed time for everything. A time to give birth, and there's a time to die. A time to plant, and there is a time to uproot. A time to kill, a time to heal, tear down, build, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to throw stones, and a time to gather them, a time to embrace, and a time to shun embracing, a time to search, and a time to give up for lost, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to tear apart, and a time to sew together, a time to be silent, and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. God has made everything appropriate in its time. Different responses for different times. That path winds many different ways. Right? This is what we see throughout. It's not just in, in the life of Jesus. We see how uh, this happens in the Old Testament as well. At one point, it's in Amos 7 in the 9th century B.C. Uh, Amos looks at the people and says to them, I despise your festivals and your worship, but let water flow like righteousness. A few centuries later in the prophet Malachi, we hear something very different. Right? Your worship is horrible. You're, you need to attend to your worship and stop offering sacrifices that are half blind and lambs that look horrible that you wouldn't even eat yourself. Right? Which one's right? Well, they're both right for their times. There's a point in, in the early on in the history of Israel where they married with other folks of the land. There's t later on in Ezra and Nehemiah in th that time period they, they divorce all the foreign women. It's one, each one was right for their time. The narrow path following in the footsteps of Jesus, two foot wide, means that there are some times that we will embrace, and there are some times we will shun embracing. Sometimes we will search, sometimes we will give up for lost. There is a time to sow, a time to tear apart. What remains the same, no matter what the question, no matter what situ the situation is, is the person in whose path we seek to follow. We follow Jesus. We combine our reading of Jesus' words with Jesus' life, and then we seek to do what he would have done. This is the great gift of, of Jesus in many ways. Is, you know, the Old Testament law is a gift, and there is much wisdom there. But life is always far more complicated than any law can capture. Right? What we need is not a, a group of laws. What we need is someone to follow. Thank God for Jesus in whose footsteps we do follow. Growing up on our faith, move, moving, uh, as Paul talks about it, you, you leave behind the milk and you start chewing on the meat. Right? It's growing up in our faith, it, it, that's what this looks like. Letting go of wide, easy answers. Right? Just follow the Ten Commandments and call it a day. Right? It's tempting. It's nice. But we follow Jesus. Right? We follow Jesus because in following Jesus, we find the way to accept and respond to the questions and the challenges and the situations that life brings. Accepting that there's no simple answers, but there is one simple approach. Stay in the footsteps of Jesus, wherever they may lead. Amen.